Dr. Dude. read a book called The Dinosaur Chicken Conspiracy, but apparently the poultry farmers don't want us to know anything about it, so they've hushed it up. Hello from Atlanta. We went to the Natural History Museum and that was pretty neat.
present to you the top 10 weirdest looking dinosaurs. Uh, I want to state the obvious and tell you that I'm going to be butchering the names of these dinosaurs. Butchering the names of these dinosaurs. In 1856, the fossilized teeth of a small dinosaur were discovered in Montana. The species was aptly named Troodon, which means wounding teeth. When evolution passed out the stealth gene, Troodon's lucked out. This drawer contains almost all of the North American identified specimens of Troodon. Troodon was every inch the predator, with razor sharp serrated teeth and large hook-like claws. Troodon probably fed on our ancestors, the early mammals. Troodon may have posed a greater threat to mammals than any other predator on Earth. The Troodon was suddenly cut down in its prime. <laughs> Dune. Well, hello, hello, everybody. We're here today because, welcome by back. The luck of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant over mammals in ordinary true, times got objects. failed in a mass extinction. That same one you just saw. Offworld objects. Speaking of offworld objects, like that asteroid. Thank you for the continued support. I really appreciate that. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Thank you, Rizu Dago, for the 13 months there, too. Really appreciate that. Glad you got to visit the Atlanta Museum. Very cool. I heard it was wonder... I hear it's it's pretty cool, right? Don't they have a big, um... Don't they have a Giganotosaurus skeleton? Or am I thinking of a different museum? Anyway, Offer Objects, thank you for the 11 months. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing, everybody. We're gonna have a fun stream today. I hope you're ready for it. If anybody's here for the very first time, then allow me to, uh, introduce myself. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably already know that a paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular, as you can probably guess. Looking at my office here. Uh, I dig up dinosaurs during the summer. I was streaming that just a few weeks ago in Utah. And before that, I was streaming that, streaming that in Wyoming back in June. Digging up new species of dinosaur live on stream. But when I'm not out on the field, I'm here in my office, talking about fossils, sharing some of the latest news in paleontology with you, going over new discoveries, new publications, and most often answering your questions. I think it's really important for scientists, if they have the wherewithal, to reach out to the public, you know, to interface with people. Just try and break down that barrier that exists between science and scientists and the general public. That's what I'm trying to do here. So if you've got questions, I'll try to answer them for you. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Um, let me scroll up to the top and say hello to everybody, because we've not been doing enough of that recently. And then I'll show you what's cooking up on the 3D printer. We'll wait for that. Uh, Lenina was first today. How are you doing, Lenina? Welcome, welcome. Science Streams. Blint, it was great to see you in that Discord call earlier. Super excited for our science panel at TwitchCon. 
very excited about that. Kodali, what's shaking with you? It's good to see you. I hope all is well. Uh, Jody Fish, good afternoon to you also. Uh, Matt M33, how you doing, Matt? Welcome, welcome. Steely Dan, Tradoon to you too. It's good to see ya. Smorphosaurus, what's shaking with you? Your PNSO Allosaurus came. Very nice. Cool. Well, I've got an Allosaurus that is nearing completion as well. Um, it's gonna be finished printing. Sorry, that sounded weird. Uh, yeah. Uh, Welted Thistle, welcome back. It's good to have you here. Hello, hello, Pimp Cat. What's shaking with you? Good to have ya. Uh, Rizu Degu, again, thank you for the 13 months of support. I'm making my way down through chat. Pimpcat, howdy, howdy. Incinerate Gaming, how are you doing? I like how you've got your signature greeting message. Hi, guys. Hi, spelled like, hi. Welcome, Incinerate. Glad to have you here. Oscar Juniors, what's shaking with you? Glad you could make it today. Thalo, hello to you too. Hope things are good. Knight of Coins has got those dancing... Uh, global Twitch, uh, are those supposed to be dinosaurs? I guess they are. Interesting. Not sure what, uh, genus that would be, but interesting stuff. Jack Burton, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, scrolling, scrolling. Andy then did. How are you doing, Andy? Welcome, welcome. Lugnudo, hello to you. I'm glad you're back. Yeah. And... Lugnudo says, the only problems I've ever had with OBS were from me not knowing what I was doing. Oh, I've been... Oh, I get constant crashes from OBS, and it won't recognize certain cameras. I have to restart it multiple times before it chooses to cooperate. Sometimes it just... Sometimes it just refuses to open. Like, the program just won't boot. All kinds of bad stuff. But I do a lot of crazy stuff with OBS, so... Maybe that comes with the territory. Um asking a lot of this program. I appreciate it being free. Holy cow. Like the backbone of the whole live streaming industry. Thaga Meismer, how are you doing? Welcome. Welcome. It's good to have you here. Is it the first time you've seen the, uh, the Tradoon opener video song? Yeah. Um, Only Saurus says volume at 100% and is not enough. Glad you like the song, Only Saurus. Welcome back. Yeah. Uh, and Knight of Coins says, what other kinds of paleontologists are there? Many, many kinds. Holy cow. Paleontology is just the study of fossils. Fossils are the preserved remains of ancient life. So any long-dead critter, Tricky. either a, a plant, or an animal, or a fungus, or blue-green algae, or whatever else you can think of, there's a paleontologist who studies that. So a lot of people, when they think of paleontology, they think of dinosaurs in particular. Dinosaurs are kind of the superstars of the paleontology world. But um, it's only a very small percentage of paleontologists who actually work on dinosaurs at all. Most paleontologists, the vast majority, do not. They work on ancient mammals. They work on foraminifera. They work on fossil plants, fossil amphibians. Fossil fungi. Some people, like, exclusively work on fossil footprints. Um, which could be from a number of different critters. But, uh, yeah. Most paleontologists don't work on dinosaurs. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Most legendary stream? Oh, you're talking about yourself, aren't you there, Science Streams? How are you doing? It's good to have you here, Bullet. Um, and it was lovely seeing Baby Alona also there in the Discord call. Um, she seems so happy. What a what a happy, well-adjusted baby. Holy cow. You and Lita are doing something right. Tommy Plotticus is here, too. How are you doing, Tommy Plotticus? Welcome, welcome. Mia Mia Coda. Glad you could make it today. Tactical Sponge. Thank you for being here. It's good to have you. Yeah. Uh, and, oh yeah, Ken. Fossil Dung. Yeah. There are paleontologists who almost exclusively... Study fossil dung. Coprolithologists is what we call them. People like Karen Chin. She's kind of the superstar of the coprolithology world. But yeah. Anyway, good to see you, Ken. Um, welcome, welcome. And Ryu Spitfire. How are you doing, Spitfire? Welcome back. May I ask what the skull with the crest on your wall behind you is? You mean... Uh... 
<laughs> you mean that one right there? That's Dilophosaurus. You may know it from Jurassic Park, but it was actually way cooler than, than it appears in Jurassic Park. Um, it was a much larger dinosaur than appears there, and much more formidable. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. I thought you said fossil dog, not dung. No, I guess we need a, an explanatory video, don't we? Here. Um... Here we go. Let's take a look at this right here, maybe. Here we go. Uh, here, give me a second. Let me adjust things properly. There we are. Super. Analyze some coprolites from the Arctic. Herp. Like that. Turn our volume up. Let's watch. There doesn't seem to be much to find out of this. Is uh, I used to go up here almost every summer up to Egg Mountain near Shoto, Montana, because that's where our museum kept all of their field gear. We had to drive all the way up there, even if we wanted to go to a different part of the state. We had to go to Shoto first. It was a very inefficient way of doing things. On the prairie near Shoto, Montana. Yeah. But for paleontologists like Corey Coverdale, this is hallowed ground. Oh yeah. This area is famous for. It's spectacular preservation of baby dinosaurs, eggs, and those sorts of things. Oh yeah. We are very well known in, among paleontologists, and there are a lot of people who have come and studied here. In fact, the discovery that dinosaurs cared for the young was made in these hills. The very first baby yep. dinosaurs found in a nest anywhere in we the might world were discovered here. We actually talk about these the discoveries later on in the screen, too. It's another great video. In the hope of making a big discovery. They're looking for for, for skeletons, for, for baby bones especially. But some scientists are seeking treasure of a different variety. Yep. Fossilized poop. These little oh yeah. Magic package. So when, when I say that most paleontologists don't study dinosaurs, I mean, Karen Chin does study dinosaurs a bit. She studies dinosaur dung. But, uh, you know, she's not digging up dinosaur bones. You know? Yeah. Just can provide really special perspectives on ancient life. Yeah. My name is Karen Chin, and I study ancient ecosystems. And yep. to do that, I often look at fossilized feces. Technically yep. known as a coprolite. So skeletal fossils, they don't always tell you too much about the behavior of animals. Whereas if you look at fossil feces, they are a byproduct of feeding activity of an animal. Yep. But in addition to diet, they can also tell you about... HD and HB says, how is dinosaur dung different than modern dung? Uh, it tends to be older, tends to be more fossilized than modern dung. Um, and I mean, it came from a dinosaur. Um, yeah, you, you don't have to, don't overthink it what organisms might have been living along with the animal that defecated. And coprolites can also tell you about the conditions under which they were preserved. As such, they give us a totally different perspective there you go, Jody on Fish, the yeah. Yeah. environment than we get from the bones. Sadly, these fecal fortunes are there you go, HD, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that actually didn't look like dinosaur droppings in Jurassic Park, which is pretty funny. Um, yeah. Uh, dinosaur droppings would be a lot like the droppings of modern mammals, depending on on what the diet of the critter is. Yeah. It's a little bit paradoxical that an animal only died once in its lifetime, but it defecated gazillions of times. Yep. But even so, coprolites from terrestrial animals are much rarer than their skeletal fossils. Which is odd, right? has a lot to do with how fossils are formed. Most fossils are preserved when they are buried rapidly. That is often a flood event or some landslide. But in addition to that, you have to have some mineralizing agent. Like phosphorus yep. or calcium from the bones and tissues of a carnivorous dinosaur's prey. But if you take dung from herbivorous animals, in order to preserve those, you actually need an external source of a mineral 
paradoxically, yep. that comes from the bacteria that are feeding on fossil dung. Their metabolic activities can cause minerals to precipitate out. In either case, the resulting coprolites can be incredibly difficult to identify. Fossil feces can have many different colors. It can be pancake, they can be bulbous, they can be sausage shaped, and we have to look at several different techniques to try and determine if it is fossil feces or just a pretty rock. And that's the thing. Oftentimes when you go to a rock shop, they will try and sell you fossil algae or fossil plant material or something like that as dinosaur dung, as a coprolite. Coprolites are actually fairly rare, especially from herbivorous animals. So if you're, like, going to a rock shop and thinking about buying this piece of dinosaur dung that they have for sale, pretty good chance it's not dinosaur dung. Once she's fairly certain she's got the real deal, Dr. Chin can begin to investigate its origins. You don't know who the perpetrator was, right? I will first <laughs> see if I can see anything recognizable on the surface, such as dietary residues or burrows from organism that burrowed in after it was deposited. That's pretty cool when you can find burrows method. inside of it. And I cut out a little piece and then I grind that down so you can see through it. Basically, okay. it's like doing histology, but on fossil dung. That's the thing. If you want to be able to figure out what's going on inside, sometimes you gotta got to make a thin section, stick it on a microscope slide, and uh, look at it under the scope. It's almost like you're in the field. You're like searching around the slide. Oh, what is that? Clues <laughs> that say these are plant cells, these are animal Ooh, cells. This is a piece of bone. It's a piece of shell. Dr. Chin and her colleagues can then start to get into the nitty gritty. I might do chemical Dinosaurs analysis. were the sort of creatures you oh. might think of as inhabiting another planet. Hey, Ironheart. The kind you dream of in a bad nightmare. Thank you for the 38 months of support. I really appreciate that. Holy cow. 38 months? That's a long time, Ironheart. It's a very long time. There's no wonder you've got one of those founder badges. Excellent. Thank you for keeping me on the air for the past 38 months. That's almost a whole year. This is of it. To see what kind of mineral. And Claire says, what documentary is that alert from? I don't... Mm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. It's... Uh, that's definitely from... It's talking about the Central Asiatic Expeditions with Roy Chapman Andrews and the American Museum of Natural History. So if you just find some of those, then it'll pop up. Virology it had. You can look at organic geochemical analyses or... By the way, welcome, Claire. Analyses. It's good to see you here. This is doing well. a, a kind of a new field in studying coprolites. And with new techniques can come new insights. One of my colleagues, uh, James Super, analyzed some coprolites from the Arctic. Inside, hmm. he found compounds that give us clues about how warm it was. Very cool. Million years ago above the Arctic Circle. But of all the coprolites Dr. Chin has examined, None have provided more insights than those from Western Montana's Two Medicine Formation. Oh, yeah. I have spent many years <laughs> studying these. Egg Mountain and, and surrounding areas. One thing that they revealed early on was the presence of very distinctive burrows that um, indicate the activity of dung beetles. As well as the occasional snail shell. More <laughs> importantly, they were filled with tiny pieces. This is super, of, super interesting. Like, really bizarre novel dinosaur behavior might be able to be inferred from these specimens here so stay tuned this is really really cool there's a kind of a reveal these dinosaurs may have been doing something that you wouldn't necessarily expect them to be doing eating something you wouldn't expect them to be eating of conifer wood dr chin mulled over those wood fibers until she realized that the dinosaur that ate them wasn't just munching on a pine tree yeah. The wood had actually been rotted before the dinosaurs ingested it. We don't have modern mega herbivores like elephants making a practice of feeding on rotting wood, so that was What's a going on? surprise. Yeah. So Dr. Chin had a hunch that maybe these duck-billed dinosaurs had been snacking on something else entirely. Invertebrates. So, yeah, here, just to give you some background, this is the dinosaur that we're talking about here, Myasaura. Yeah, a lovely duckbill dinosaur. 
That's actually a really nice illustration there. I like that a lot. Um, very nice. The Good Mother Lizard, Myasora. Fairly big critter. Um, but the really cool thing about... Well, these are, you know, these are plant-eating dinosaurs. Duckbill dinosaurs ate plants. We've got lots of lines of evidence that show that. However, something else is going on. Why are they eating rotting wood? What? Feeding on rotting wood, so that was a real surprise. Yeah. Dr. Chin had a hunch that maybe these duckbill dinosaurs had been snacking on something else entirely. Hmm. Vertebrates frequent rotting wood, so if those dinosaurs needed a good source of protein, they yeah. a rotten log, and that's a great way to find proteinaceous invertebrates so by like going to a rotten log and just eating everything in it you're going to be getting a lot of arthropod protein all kinds of grubs and ants and just all kinds of little buggy morsels of goodness and if these dinosaurs are visiting this area because they're breeding and about to lay their eggs they're going to need a lot more protein in order to be able to sustain themselves and also you know, gestate those eggs, um, or produce those eggs so that they can lay them. And so maybe this is a novel kind of behavior that's happening in this area, or maybe they're doing it all over the place. It's hard to say, but uh, pretty cool. That these dinosaurs seem to have been eating eating rotten logs to get to the bugs inside. If those dinosaurs needed a good source of protein, yeah. go to a rotten log. And I want a Niffler says, so the early ancestor of the anteater? No. So these dinosaurs are not the ancestors of any, but they, they go extinct at the end of the Cretaceous. Anteaters are a kind of mammal completely unrelated to these guys. Completely unrelated. Just to clear that up. Again, that's a yeah. great way to find proteinaceous invertebrates. Her hypothesis was backed up when colleagues at the Denver Museum of Natural History and Science made their nice. own fecal find. They found coprolites in the Kaparowitz Formation, which is the same age as a tree medicine, they also in, uh, have Utah. rotted wood inside. They also huh. have evidence of dung beetles inside. Oh, so maybe this isn't something that the myosaurs are only doing near their nesting ground. Other dinosaurs are doing this elsewhere, too. But in addition, they have huh. pieces of broken up crustaceans. They were clearly broken up, so they were ingested. Put together, these plain lumpy rocks. So this dinosaur, I don't know if that was a duckbill dinosaur or maybe a ceratopsian. Like I think, um, Cosmoceratops is from the Kuiperowitz, if I remember correctly. Um, here we go. Yeah, this dinosaur right here, I think is from the Kuiperowitz, unless it's from Grand Staircase Escalante. It might be from Grand Staircase. Um, let's see. Kyperowitz, Ceratopsian. There we go. So, yeah, we've got Nasutoceratops, and we've got Cosmoceratops too? Okay, cool. Anyway, so it could have been one of these dinosaurs, not just eating plants, but also eating presumably crayfish or something like that. Really interesting. It has been hypothesized before that maybe ceratopsians like this um, would have been omnivorous. Um, yeah. Uh, Mark Witten had a really nice illustration of this. Uh... Of a Styracosaurus eating a Tyrannosaur. Um, yeah. You know, they've got big, sharp beaks, and they've got these really efficient, nice, like, chewing, slicing teeth. Maybe they could have done that, you know? It's definitely not a stretch for them to be eating crayfish. We have evidence of some kind of herbivorous dinosaur eating crayfish. But maybe these guys would also, you know, eat a dead dinosaur carcass if they came across it, you know? Yeah. And yeah, there you go, uh, Javasaurus. Mark Witten did put the quills on it, like the Ceratopsian. Uh, like Cetacosaurus. But yeah. And isn't the Kuiperowitz in Grand Staircase? I guess it is, Ken, isn't it? Shoot. Yeah. 
I think it is. <laughs> and Miffler says, so almost like pregnancy supplements for the female dinosaurs. Maybe? We don't actually know if these particular poopetrators, as Karen Chin puts it, were female or not. But, um, yeah, interesting stuff. Broken up crustaceans. They were clearly broken up, so they were ingested. Put together, these plain lumpy rocks reveal a whole ecosystem. We have hadrosaurs, we have conifers, we have white rot fungi, and we have dung beetles and snails all in this one ecosystem, and we have fossil evidence of how these guys interacted. That's pretty darn cool. get that from simple body fossils. Yep. Out on the prairie of western Montana, precious coprolites are waiting to be dug up. You probably won't see them displayed in a museum like fossil bones, but they're sure to provide us a spectacular glimpse into the ancient past. Neat stuff. Yeah. So just to emphasize again, paleontology is not just dinosaurs. Certainly not. And even if we are studying dinosaurs, it's not necessarily just dinosaur bones. There are as many different ways to be a paleontologist as there are different paleontologists. The, you know, the history of the Earth is a long, immensely, incredible, unfathomably long, and rich, and beautiful, and complex object of study. If you want to know about Earth's past, there's... There's so much out there to be discovered. So many different ways to study it. Uh, the early duckbill catches the snail. There you go, Andy. Yeah. Yeah. Precious copper lights. I agree, but I would never have put it that way. Well, <laughs> I, it's, it's novel, isn't it, Ken? I like that. Yeah. Um... And yeah, that is a thing. Yeah, deer will sometimes eat small animals. They'll eat mice and stuff like that. Um, and like if they happen across a, like a nest of mice, they'll just eat them. Um, it's hard sometimes for plant-eating animals to get enough protein. So if there's just a ready source of protein right there, sometimes they'll just eat them. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, Ragandar, you and Lenina have been posting about that. That's pretty cool. Humble Bundle... With Saurian and uh, and Dinosaur Fossil Hunter, I believe. Let's look this up. There we go. Dino Fever Game Bundle. Yeah, Saurian and Dinosaur Fossil Hunter. I would recommend both of those games, especially Saurian. Um, pretty cool. So I'll give you a link to this. Kodali pointed it out. Thank you, Kodali. Excellent. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, content factory right there. I mean, I don't need this kind of thing for content. And I probably wouldn't want to play most of these games. Because they involve, like, doing unkind things to dinosaurs. And you know what? That's not my job. As a paleontologist, my job is to be kind two fossils. As a dinosaur paleontologist, it's my job is to be kind to dinosaur fossils in particular. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, Saurian and Dinosaur Fossil Hunter, I would recommend both of those. And I've played both of those live on stream. Actually, if you go to the Dinosaur Fossil Hunter uh, Steam page, there is, there's video of me playing the game there on the Steam page. They were pretty excited about that, to have a real paleontologist play in the game. So, yeah. Um, anyway. Oscar Jr. said, so you never played Duck Hunt? No, it's barbaric. Why would I do that? <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah. You also get to really spruce up the exhibits. That's super cool, Jody Fish. I might have to do that one of these days. Especially since... Between you and me right now, chat. Um, here, come a little bit closer. I might be, at some point over the next year or so, doing some exhibits work 
potentially putting together some stuff for some museum exhibits. We'll see. Um, in the real world, I mean, not in a game. So yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. And I like the history sprinkled in there. Says Ken. What about what? What do you mean? Did I miss something? Uh, but yeah. Speaking of displays, that will be museum quality. Here is our Allosaurus skull that we are almost done printing. I have got the last two bones printing right now. There's one and two right there. So these are going to be on the back of the skull. These are, um... I think these are the Jugals right here that are printing. Uh, left and right. These are our last two bones. After this, it's just the teeth. And I think I might be able to do the teeth either overnight or I might do the teeth tomorrow during stream. But, uh, yeah. A Nightfall the Red. Most of these are 3D prints behind me, yes. Just like the one that I'm doing right here. Um, some of the files have come from scientific papers, where the, the actual 3D data are included in the supplemental info for the paper. And some of these are available online on sites like Thingiverse, and, uh, and Colts 3D, and Morphosource, and uh, Sketchfab is another big one. So yeah, if you have a specific question about a specific one of these, let me know, and I can fill you in. Um... But yeah, it might be cool to have like a directory of these at some point. One day when I build a, a website, I think that would be pretty neat, actually. We'll see. Oh, uh, but the audiobook of When Life Nearly Died. I need to check that out, Ken. I tried to find the second edition used. I couldn't find it anywhere. It's not on thrift books. So maybe I'll, I'll get the audiobook. Yeah. And a Nightfall would be fantastic. A directory would be fantastic, says Nightfall. I'll, uh, I'll see if I can do that. That might be a really cool thing, actually, to add to my my website when I end up building that. And that was free on Audible? Holy cow, Lenina. I need to check that out. Good audiobook? Let me do that right now, actually. Here, keep an eye on the 3D printer. Let me do this before I forget. Um... Mm-hmm. Life Nearly Died by Michael J. Benton. There we go. Add to library. Excellent. Done. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ken and Lenina, for that suggestion there. Awesome. Well, I am currently printing. This right here, a life-size Allosaurus skull. We are nearly done with this now. Right now we're just printing these bones in the back right here. That's not the jugal, that is the quadrate? Quadrato jugal? Quadrato jugal, I think. An anonymous gifter, thank you. Thank you so much for those five gift subs there, Anonymous Gifter. You are as generous as you are mysterious, and I appreciate you for it. Thank you very much. Good stuff. Holy cow. There's now five people in the chat who won't have to worry about any ads for the next 30 days. We'll get an uninterrupted paleontologizing experience here. And that's thanks to you, Anonymous. Thank you very much. Um... Yeah, and look, we are now one twelfth of the way to our sub goal, too. Yeah, check that out. Very nice. Yeah. And it's the Quadrato Jugal. There we go. Thank you, Ken. Good stuff. Yeah. We're, that, no. That's the one we want. Yeah. So 
so let's check out our revised osteology of Allosaurus here. There we go. So yeah, the quadrato jugal, that's this bone right here. So this is the last one that we're printing on either side. And then we will be all finished. I might do final assembly Monday or maybe Friday. We'll figure that out. Yeah. Let me show you what we've got so far, by the way. And hang on, I was showing you the correct screen here, right? Quadrato Jugal. There we go. Once again, to recap, here is our lower jaw, now fully printed and assembled. It's actually been fully printed and assembled for a while now, since before I left for the field this summer. But I just want to show you again. The rest of the skull right here except for the brain case and various other fiddly weird looking bones in the back of the skull yeah pretty awesome this is this is not a small print definitely not yeah i'm uh i'm very excited about this and then to go on the back there we've got the brain case and associated small fiddly weird looking bones There we are. Uh, let me orient that correctly. There's our occipital condyle. This is what attaches to the neck vertebrae. There's the foramen magnum. That is the hole that the uh, spinal cord goes through uh, to get to the brain. And we've got a few bones that have just finished printing. I'll attach them to this right now. We'll get this thing assembled. Yeah. What's going on here? Oh, shoot. Smorphosaurus, I hope you're doing okay. Shoot, that's not good. Um, yeah, if you've got a wound like that, put pressure on it. And uh, have some sort of cloth, a towel, something like that on there. And elevate it as well you can, too. Um, try and put it above your heart because that'll keep the blood pressure down on it, and that'll help with the, uh... Uh... It'll help with the bleeding. Um... Yeah. Anyway, but if, uh... If it doesn't stop soon, uh, I hope you know what to do, Smurf. Make sure that you, you call for help. Yeah. Um... Field trauma expert. I have taken a couple of of like wilderness first aid training courses, but I've never actually been woofer certified. So I'm not a certified wilderness first responder. Maybe next year I will be, if I take the courses again. But uh, yeah. Mr. R contains almost all of the North American identified specimens of troodon. Well, hello, hello, nicotine. Welcome to paleontologizing. How are you doing? It's great to have you here. Holy moly, nicotine, is it okay if I, uh, if I, I tell chat how I know you? We were actually just talking earlier. Um, this is exciting. Yeah, or if you would like to say, uh, it's a state secret for now? Okay. Well, cool. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> Uh, it's great to have you here, Nicotine. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Holy cow, it's great to have you here. Um, actually, you know what? Should we play a, a welcome video? To welcome Nicotine to the channel? Uh, would you like that, Nicotine? It's like four or five minutes, something like that. Um, and that'll give me some time to get all of this ready because we're going to be assembling more of our Allosaurus skull. I can have all the pieces arranged and everything. Okay. Uh, without further ado, we're going to call forth our good friend, previously recorded Danny. And, uh, you know what? He wasn't expecting to be called forth this early. So, uh, 
chat, can you uh maybe say something to help help coax him out? Let's see. Say, please come here. Previously recorded, Danny, or something like that. He also really likes the number one. If you type a one at a chat, that usually brings. It. Okay, here he comes. Without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to previously recorded Danny. Previously recorded, Danny. Go ahead and take it away. Thanks, present day Danny. You know, people ask me all the time, Danny, how did you first get interested in paleontology? And I've always been interested in fossils from the earliest time I can remember, particularly dinosaurs. My parents like to say that I decided I wanted to become a paleontologist pretty much the moment I realized I couldn't grow up to be a dinosaur. And believe me, I tried. I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a lovely place to grow up. Except that we haven't got any dinosaur fossils here. So right after high school, I packed up and moved to Montana, one of the best places in the world to find dinosaurs. Just a couple days after I arrived in Montana, I started working at the lab at Museum of the Rockies in the paleontology program founded by Jack Horner. Jack's done a lot of amazing things in his career, but you may know him as the scientific advisor on the movie Jurassic Park. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted a credible resource that could back up several theories that we were sort of expounding. And one was that dinosaurs eventually evolved into birds. And even the word raptor means bird of prey. And that's something that Jack Horner believes in and could defend if necessary. And Jack Horner became our credibility. It was in this program that Jack built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist and how to think outside the box. I've done work at a number of other museums around the American West, helping to prep fossils, design exhibits, and educate visitors. I did a fair bit of eclectic field work in various places, identifying and collecting early Cretaceous dinosaur tracks on the Idaho border, Sphenodontian fossils in the gravelly range of the Rocky Mountains, Cenozoic fishes in western Nevada, but most of my work out in the field was with Dr. Denver Fowler, who is now curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. In all, I've worked probably a few hundred sites throughout the late Cretaceous of Montana and the Hell Creek and Judith River formations, digging up dinosaurs. Lots and lots and lots of dinosaurs. And from time to time, that work has even garnered some media attention. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. And uh, much like my field work, my research focuses on dinosaurs. I'm particularly interested in their behavioral functional morphology. All these bizarre anatomical features that certain dinosaurs had, I want to know what they used them for. Right now, I'm working on a study on spinosaurs. All right, but don't ask me too much about that because it's, uh, Still a project in the works, and I can't give away too much just yet till it's published. But anyway, a couple of years ago, I realized that things were definitely headed downhill in Montana. So I packed up and headed back to the West Coast. And I've become kind of fed up with all the bullshit in academia, so uh, I found myself another job. I am now a teacher in early childhood education. And let me tell you, it's been a natural fit since day one. Now, given that I get to design the curriculum, my students now know more about biology, classification, and the history of life on Earth than most adults do. I've been helping raise a new generation of young scientists. Then, coronavirus hit. In mid-March, when all the schools shut down in San Francisco, I started holding classes over Zoom, and we picked up right where we left off. One, two, Three. I love digging in the dirt with just a pick and brush. Finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things like Velociraptor's jump or Archaeopteryx's wings and all the kids who want to see them lining up. 
I realized that I really enjoy teaching remotely, so back in May, I decided to try streaming on Twitch. And here we are. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? I believe that scientists ought to be public servants. Ultimately, it's our job not just to make scientific discoveries, but to teach the public about them. That's exactly what I want to do here. Now, because of COVID-19, this will be my first summer in almost 10 years with no fieldwork. I'm trying to look on the bright side, though. It's not all bad. It, at least I have more time for outreach. And I've got plenty of cool stuff to work on. And if you could throw some support my way by subscribing, I'd be incredibly grateful. So anyway, if you are new here, you should be pretty well clued in by now. And uh, I'm glad you're here. I hope you're having a good time. Anyway, let's uh, see what present-day Danny has cooked up for us. All right, present-day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And uh, hopefully that gives you a good sense for what this channel's all about. Uh, thanks for being here, Nicotine. I hope you're not caught behind the ad right now. Shoot. Um, but yeah, yeah. Good stuff. Blinniness says, the field streams were so great, really interesting, and the crew was hilarious. It really worked out pretty well, Lenina. I'm uh, pretty happy about how all that went, absolutely. And we even have a crew member here in chat right now. At least one. Maybe there's more lurkers, but Ken is here. Uh, Ken was one of our uh, our core crew members in Wyoming and in Utah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Nightfall the Red says, Danny, what is that skull rotating in your bookcase? Ooh, who can tell me what this critter is? We were talking about this extensively on Monday. Who is this? One of the most important dinosaurs ever found. Yeah. Uh, that's me, says Lugnito. Really? You're Deinonychus? <laughs> yeah, that is, of course, Deinonychus, a.k.a. the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park, which isn't actually Velociraptor. find you a nice Deinonychus picture. That's a pretty decent one. Yeah. Uh, this is perhaps my favorite Deinonychus image of our modern age. We now know these animals had feathers all over their bodies. A Velociraptor would have also. Um, so yeah, yeah, pretty cool animal. And to re reiterate, the Velociraptors from Jurassic Park, actually Deinonychus. Yeah, with his powerful jaws and his terrible claw, ghostly ghoul. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, yeah. And are any of the mods paleontologists? No? Shoot, unless we make Ken a mod. <laughs> Ken is, uh, is going to be going into school for paleontology very soon. and Very soon? I don't know how soon. Soon enough, let's hope. And uh, he knows a great deal about fossil science. Um, yeah. Uh, Ken would be a fun addition, but that's, you know, some people don't want to be mods. I've asked some members of this community if they wanted to be a moderator. Some very valuable, you know, well-established members of this community, and they didn't want to because it might not be as much fun for them, you know, if they've got mod privileges and I was going to say duties, but most of the time, we've got a really nice community here. It's rare that the mods really have to do very much at all. Um, it's a haul, and that's fine, says Lenina. I mean, it, yeah, it is. Not all of our mods are here all the time. You've been doing a wonderful job of that, actually, Lenina. You and Claire are, uh, incredible. But, yeah. But, yeah, if you wanted to be a moderator, Ken, we can certainly make that happen. I definitely trust you. Ken is, uh, I think our values are aligned there. 
Well, no, that, that makes it seem like it's in opposition. Values aligned. Yeah. HD and HP says that's how you get banned. See? And he's got a great sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> anyway. Can, uh, yeah. Yeah. The mods... Okay, you're right, Lordy. The mods do a ton. I mean, it's not like they have to ban people left and right. But... And, you know... You make a good point there, Lordy, actually. Thank you for calling me out on this. I, I deserve that. The reason why we have such a wonderful community here is in part because of the hard work of the mods. Making sure that things stay... On topic, things stay family friendly, that we don't have harassment or bullying or, you know, or anything like that. And honestly, stuff probably happens that I don't even notice because the mods are so on top of it. So, yeah, yeah. They were cut hard as all I'm saying? You're totally right, Lordy. Yeah, agreed. So, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Um, the ones do a stunning job. They absolutely do. I mean, and that is something that is worthy of all of the applause. Yes, indeed. Thank you, moderators. You know how much we love you. Thank you very, very much for all your hard work. Yeah. Um, anyway, what were we, uh... What were we doing? I'm on... I'm on a lot now. I just can't promise I'll always be this present. Yeah, and it... It's no obligation, Ken. If you want mod privileges, just let me know. But you, it's not like you have to be here all the time, or even most of the time, or even any of the time. Um... I appreciate you, Kim. Yeah. Could T-Rex clap? No. Shoot. Tyrannosaurus, it might not have even been able to bring its its palms together at all at any stage in its life. This is what it's a juvenile right here. See these floor limbs? Right there. I'll put my hand over it so you can see a little bit better. These... When they're young, they could probably touch their fingers together when they're young, but as they as these animals get larger, more mature, and they bulk up, they may not have been able to actually touch their fingers to each other at all. It really seems like these arms are kind of on their way out. There's, uh... There's an idea that if Tyrannosaurus had been allowed to continue to evolve, it may have just lost its arms altogether. Unfortunately, Tyrannosaurus, well, unfortunately for it, fortunately for us, these animals got wiped out by that asteroid 66 million years ago. T-Rex was one of the very last of the dinosaurs. It's one of the ones that actually got wiped out by the asteroid. And if that hadn't happened, we would not be here today, you know? There's no reason to think that uh, mammals would have ever taken off if it hadn't been for that extinction event. Um, but yeah, so imagine that that asteroid had missed Earth, though, and these animals had been allowed to continue to evolve. There's an idea that maybe they would have lost their four limbs entirely. I'll show you an illustration of this. It's an uh, old illustration by Greg Paul. Here it is. From his Scientific American Book of Dinosaurs. Um, and so this is a, like hypothetical N none of these dinosaurs ever existed this is like a thought experiment if the asteroid hadn't struck well maybe you would have still had grasses evolve like they did during the age of mammals but then dinosaurs would have rapidly changed like they always did you know ceratopsians looking like this really weird looking oh, it's the they almost look like uh like if Pachyrhinosaurus had continued to evolve. Here is like a Lambiosaurus descendant, I guess. 
and look very closely here. That Tyrannosaur hadn't got any arms anymore. There's just little nubbins in its place. See? Yeah. So it's a neat idea. Um. Yeah. Because if those those arms on Tyrannosaurus weren't really useful for anything, it would make sense. You know, for the just for them to just become vestigial and eventually. Know, fade away. That's what tends to happen in evolution when a structure isn't used anymore. When there's no downside to getting rid of it, just random mutations tend to just get rid of it after a while. You know? Kind of like wisdom teeth in humans. We don't have any use for them anymore. So there's some human beings that have a mutation in which they don't have wisdom teeth. I'm one of those humans, by the way. No wisdom teeth in here. Yeah. Or have like one quarter of one wisdom tooth or something like that. And, you know, I don't think I'll ever have to have it removed because it's not been a problem up to now. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Linnea says, Blue and I were watching Black Mirror, and in one, one episode they mentioned T-Rex. The closed captioning got it right, and I was so happy. Oh, nice. They punctuated T-Rex correctly? Very cool. That's pretty rare. Oftentimes people put a dash in there when it should be a dot and a space. But, you know, that's a minor thing. It's a minor thing. Ugh. Sounds way better than the can't eat cilantro mutation. Yeah, Steely, I love cilantro. And uh, my wisdom teeth don't get in the way because I don't have any. Uh, I'm interested in the dinosaurs with wing loss. Interesting, kitty cat. I think there's only one dinosaur that's ever entirely lost its arms or wings, like completely 100%. I think that's the Moa? Is that right? Or is it the elephant bird? Um. Yeah. Yep, the Moa of New Zealand. Uh, Dinornis, I believe. Yeah. There we go. So this gigantic flightless bird, they've got no remnants at all of their wings. Completely gone. Living creatures from the dawn of time. Well, well, well. What lives will they destroy? Buttercup E. panic and terror will they create? Welcome, Buttercup. It is great to have you here. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. And their 67 raiders have arrived to wreak some sweet, sweet havoc. Hello, hello, Buttercup and raiders. How are you doing? Welcome back to Paleontologizing. It's really good to have you here. How did your stream go, Buttercup? Tell me about it. And raiders. Tell me how it went. Yes, yes. Welcome. Welcome. If any of you are here for the very first time, let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some science outreach, talking to people about dinosaurs, which are what I work on, fossils in general, the history of life on Earth, and why it's important. So uh, welcome. Let me know if you've got any questions. Uh, Kara Blue Tree, uh, Bola Heavy Rock, Gargoware, Kimu, Kichiara. It's great to have you here. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. And Dionis de Chile. Bienvenidos a Paleontologizing. Y gracias por seguirme. It's great to have you here. Um, we are going to be. Wrong button. Assembling more of our Allosaurus skull in just a couple minutes. But I think we might have another welcome video warranted. I don't know. What do you think? Should we call forth previously recorded Danny again before we get to assembling more of our Allosaurus skull? Give me a one in chat if you'd like to see him again in a different video. It's not the same video. Yeah. 
mammals would still be small creatures like yep. this living in the nooks and crannies of their world, and we wouldn't be here. Lao Cordoni, thank you for the follow, and welcome to Paleontology. All right, I'm seeing some, some ones here. Here we go. Yeah, we talked about Nessie, new investigations again. The Loch Ness Monster, really? Interesting. Well, I want to hear about that in a little bit, maybe. But, uh... I honestly don't know if we have enough ones in the chat to call forth previously recorded Danny. That was so recently we just played that other video. Um... Okay, I'm seeing some more ones. All right. Without further ado, we will call back previously recorded Danny. And he is already bounding forth. Uh, he'll tell you about who I am, what this channel is all about, all that good stuff from a different location. Uh, previously recorded Danny, where are you uh, talking to us from now? Well, thanks for present day, Danny. Well, if you happen to be new around here, then welcome to Paleontologizing. You may well be wondering to yourself, uh, well, if this is Twitch, then where are the video games? I'm gonna level with you here. I don't really do much in the way of video games. I'm a paleontologist. My name is Danny Anduza, and dinosaurs are my area of study. How in the world does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, you're about to find out. When I finished high school, I moved to Montana and immediately started work at the Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was an unparalleled powerhouse of paleobiology. And that program was built by this guy. Famed paleontologist Alan Grant. Well... Kind of. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Jack Horner, the real-life Alan Grant. He's one of the most prominent and controversial paleontologists in the country, a dyslexic MacArthur Foundation genius who never finished college and who says he doesn't care why dinosaurs went extinct. To him, the important part is how they lived. It was at Museum of the Rockies, under the auspices of Jack Warner, that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. And a huge part of that I learned by working with Jack's final graduate student, a guy by the name of Denver Fowler, who would later go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Working with Denver, I did summer after summer of fieldwork in the remote Badlands of Montana. Together, we dug up more dinosaurs than we knew what to do with, at fossil sites numbering in the hundreds. In 2012, I discovered a new species of ceratopsian dinosaur, hopefully soon to be published. The next year, we excavated the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. Then, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. Not bad, right? Well, anyway, much like my fieldwork, my research also focuses on dinosaurs. For example, here's Trirarchuncus, the last of the alvarosaurs, just published in July of 2020. One of my current projects focuses on spinosaurids. I can't really talk too much about that until it's a little bit closer to publication, so uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things in Montana were declining rapidly. So I picked up and moved on to greener pastures. I'm so glad I did. And with that new perspective, I also realized that I have very little patience with the soul-crushing bureaucracy within academia. For the time being, anyway, I decided to take my career in a slightly different direction. I got hired for a job in early childhood education. 
As a teacher, I get to have a positive impact on kids' lives, help them find a passion for science. Then when COVID-19 showed up, the school had to close. But that didn't stop the teaching or the learning. We just moved online. All right, friends. So we're gonna be looking at a book in a little bit, but I thought we'd start off with a song. At three, two, two. one. Oh, give me a home where the hadrosaurs roamed, where triceratops bellowed and grazed, where erosion uncovers bones we seek to discover, for to strike the whole world amazed. It was a pretty easy jump from teaching online to streaming on Twitch. I had my first broadcast in May. I've been on here ever since. Now I believe pretty strongly that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about her science is one of the most important things that a researcher can do. I now have a golden opportunity to reach out directly to people where they are. This is what I'm all about. And now, thanks to Twitch, I get to share it with you. And I'm so happy to be able to do so. It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help by following, or if you could afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So anyway, to my regular viewers, thank you again for sitting through this. And to everybody who's new, welcome. I'm genuinely, earnestly glad that you're here. And I hope you stick around. We've got a remarkable little community here, and i uh, be delighted if you join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And thank you even more to Bird on a Banjo for that raid. Bird Welcome to the channel. Hello, hello. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Thank you also, Buttercup E, for that raid that kicked off that welcome video. Excellent stuff. Um, Tank1985, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Bird on a banjo. I was trying to read your name differently. I'm like, Birdano Banjo? Que es esto? Confused. No sé. Birdano Banjo. No, bird on a banjo. Welcome to the channel. It's good to have you here. Um, welcome to Paleontologizing. Shoot. I know you didn't see most of the welcome video, so let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. You said this is your first raid ever? Holy cow. How did your stream go? Tell me about it. Welcome to Twitch. Welcome to streaming. How are you doing? It's good to have you here. Uh, yeah. And San Diego Zoo is here too. Welcome, welcome, San Diego Zoo. Hello, hello. I hope you're doing well. Man, everybody's here today. This is excellent. Yeah. And uh, Banjo says, I love it your way. Birdona Banjo. Bienvenidos a Birdona Banjo. Uh, yeah. I uh, only started just doing streams. It's a fun, lively group of people in my stream, and I get to do things like this. Awesome, man. It is awesome, isn't it? Banjo, cheers. Welcome. We're about to, uh, continue assembly of our life-size Allosaurus skull. We're printing the last bones of our Allosaurus skull right now. It's gonna look like this when it's assembled. And it's... Mostly assembled. Let me show you. El sábado, claro que sí, Ken. Sábado gigante. Sábado gigante. This is what we've got so far. The brain case 
bits back here we're still working on. And that's part of what we'll be assembling today. Brain case, by the way. Yeah. And uh, I'll see you later, Buttercup. You enjoy your dinner. Take care. I'll see you around. Thank you again for the raid. Can we get one more shout out for uh, Buttercup? Excuse me. For Buttercup E? Thank you, Buttercup. Appreciate you. And let's get a shout out for Bird on a Banjo as well. Uh, a new streamer. That's awesome, to have seven people in one of your first streams. Excellent. And Leslie, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Uh, yeah, let's start putting some more pieces onto this. Newly printed Allosaurus bones. Let's get them onto our Allosaurus skull. At this rate, I'll be done with this. The field is narrow to what we understand. This On week. The contrary, we stretch our understanding to try and take in the universe. And April one, I L April, 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 April O'Neil maybe. Thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. It's tricky when there's no like uh, capitalization changes in a username like that. Here we go. We'll be... We got there. We did, April O'Neil. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Uh, so we're going to be attaching the post-orbital bones on here. That's other side. Here we go. This is going to go on here just like this. There we go. So this is the margin of the eye socket right here. What you're looking at right there. Yeah, hence the post-orbital behind the orbit. Um, oh, and here, I feel like I should do this. because We've got new folks here. Many people who are here might not realize that the skull is actually made up of a bunch of different bones, including in a human skull. When you think of the word skull, you think of like a solid mass of bone. You may not realize that there are actually a bunch of different bones in a human skull, just like there are in all animal skulls. And humans, they're just very well fused for the most part, so that's why you think of it as like a solid thing. But each one of these is a different bone. And in dinosaurs, that's more obvious because most dinosaurs, uh, with a few exceptions, have um, big fenestrae windows in their skulls filled with, you know, pneumatized spaces, air sacs, stuff like that, to have very, like, lightweight, frankly, more efficient skulls than those of mammals, if we're talking about, like, weight saving. Um, so some of the bones that we're going to be attaching right now would be the post-orbital, which in us is, I think that's the, is this the jugal? Yeah which I think has a different name in humans, too. I think our post-orbital is actually fused on to the frontals there. But let's let's check. Um, where is post-orbital bone in humans? Uh, I guess it's called the post-orbital bar. It's a bony arch structure that connects the frontal bone of the skull to the zygomatic arch. So it was right there, just like I was showing you. Yeah. Uh, so that is it right there, I believe. Yeah, or maybe it's this. No, it's got to be right there. Yeah, so it's basically fused onto the frontal bone, your forehead bone. Yeah. Uh... Tila Aurora says, that animation shows how I feel with a migraine. Oh boy, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, uh... Will it provide some small bit of comfort, knowing that you've got a bunch of different bones in there and not just one? Maybe not. I don't know. I think it's cool to know, though. So again, this is our Allosaurus, and... 
here is a skull diagram. So that is this bone right here. The post orbital is what we are attaching. Yes, indeed. And that's going to attach to the jugal also. So let's get to it. Again, there's our brain case. There's our post-orbital bone. So that is going to fit on right there. And there's a little bit of flex here, so I'm going to have to hold this in place as it cures. So, uh, yeah. Just learned how to 3D print a new one. There you go, Tila, yeah. <laughs> Anybody recognize this song in the chat? Mm. Um, and let's see here. Did you make the ones behind you, Tank? Yeah, all of these I 3D printed. Everything except for the little Velociraptor skull right here behind the microphone. All the rest of these are 3D printed. And I'm working on more. I, uh, I actually found a bunch of new files this morning that I'm pretty excited about. Including a beautiful Spinosaurid skull, the Dinosaur Irritator. Which caused much strife to the paleontologist who purchased the specimen, because they purchased it from a shady commercial fossil dealer. But uh, hopefully, it will not be irritating to me. Hopefully, that print is going to go really well. Alright. Putting glue on here. There we go. Nice. So I'm going to have to hold this in place for a while. Hope that's okay. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, while we're waiting here, you should tell me how your day is going. Tank says, wow, I'm sitting here with my mouth wide open. I'm amazed and blown away. I'm flattered. Well, welcome to paleontologizing. Yeah. Uh, I've been streaming for almost three and a half years now, and I've been 3D printing for a little bit longer than that, so it's taken a while to uh, accrue this big menagerie of, of fossil prints, but uh, I think it's been worth the effort for sure. Uh, uh, I don't know what you mean. Oh, there you go, Tila, yeah. <laughs> I work on Spinosaurids, by the way. I'll be publishing a paper on their uh, their ecology and feeding behavior soon. Holy cow! Murph! My goodness. There's our dinosaur right there, Allosaurus. It's the one we're assembling. It's the last time I'll play with a dinosaur. Dinosaur. Thank you so much, Murph. You just said 20 subs. Holy cow. 20! Gift subs from Murph. Um, I would uh, be waving my arms all over the place in gratitude if I didn't have to hold this together right now. But thank you, thank you, Murph. Holy cow. There are now 20 people. 20 very lucky viewers who won't have to watch any ads for the next month. Thanks to you, Murph. So thank you for that. Holy cow. Good stuff. Uh, let's make it 21, says Tila. Yeah. Uh, Lukash got one. Okay. Tila, thank you so much for the two months of support. Really appreciate that. Holy cow. Good stuff. Good stuff. 
Experience Extraordinary. Murph, thank you so much for being such a stalwart supporter of this community also. Um, I appreciate that more than you know. Thank you very, very much. Holy cow. Um, almost single-handedly getting us to uh, half, almost halfway to our sub-goal for the day. Beautiful. Yeah. Hey, just roaming around. How you doing? Welcome, welcome. The dinosaur man, yeah. And, uh, Lordy. I really appreciate that, Lordy. Thank you for those 300 bits. Extraordinary. Look, we got a hype train going here. Beautiful. That's excellent. It really is. Thank you, Lordy. Good stuff. Stretchy McSkin wants to know if most dinosaurs were warm-blooded. Uh, today, yes, all of them are. Birds are living dinosaurs, and birds are endothermic, warm-blooded. But during the Mesozoic era, when there were other dinosaurs except for birds walking around doing their thing. And thank you, Kabaird, for those hundred bits. Really appreciate that. Dinosaurs had more diverse and varied metabolisms during the age of dinosaurs, but most of them still would have been warm-blooded, I think. We've got good evidence that most theropod dinosaurs, the two-legged meat eaters, the ones that birds evolved from, they were warm-blooded, which makes sense if warm-blooded birds evolved from them. Most of the sauropod dinosaurs, the big four-legged, long-necked plant-eating dinosaurs, they were warm-blooded too. And then the bird-hipped dinosaurs, ornithischians, the ones that are not closely related to birds, oddly enough, um, they were kind of a mixed bag. Some of them were warm-blooded, some of them, like stegosaurs, may have been a little bit more ectothermic. Maybe not generating as much of their body heat from the food that they ate. But we're still kind of figuring that out. But for the most part, dinosaurs were warm-blooded, yes. I'm comfortable in saying that because that goes against the, uh... Try blaming the dinosaurs. Thank you, Nell. Oh, Nell. Thank you for the 100 bits. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I'm comfortable saying, oh yeah, most dinosaurs were warm-blooded, just because that'll surprise a lot of people. Especially older folks who grew up with the idea of, like, cold-blooded reptilian, reptilian dinosaurs. Um, so yeah, I like to, uh, I like to shake expectations like that a little bit. Uh, buck expectations. And, uh, and surprise people, you know? So, yeah. Um, warm blood, warm hearts. There you go, ghostly ghoul. Yeah, yeah. Milky Hoot says, interesting. G -g -g yes. There. Keyboard closer. Um... Where is the... There we go. A long-standing and fundamental question about dinosaurs may finally have an answer. Step, step guide to becoming a fossil. Oh. Step one, die. Victorious, thank you for the 14 months. Thank you for helping me avoid that untimely fate through your support. Thank you, Victorious. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Stegosaurus. That's actually the walking with dinosaurs Stegosaurus right there that they use. That's funny. Um, that may have been sort of cold-blooded. Like, its temperature may have been con controlled by external factors. But uh, the rest of these three dinosaurs, and this Plesiosaur over here, who's not a dinosaur, were warm-blooded, though. And there's Allosaurus, by the way, which is the dinosaur we're assembling right now. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, by looking at the interior of the bones through a microscope and looking for signs of metabolism, you might finally have a more or less definitive answer on that. I don't know. A few things in science are ever, like, truly, truly a million percent definitive. But, uh, we're getting close with that one, I feel. 
if they like boop on the snoots. I I think it depends how it's delivered, Tila. I'm sure they'd love a boop on the snoot from you. Uh, all right, let's attach our other post-orbital bone on here. Uh, there we go. Right here, just like... It's the wrong bone. Hang on a minute. Nope. I had it in the wrong place. There we go. Right there, just like that. Lovely. Let's get it on there. So... First off, some Gorilla Glue. It's great for filling gaps. And, uh-oh, did I put that in the wrong spot? I may have. Might need to wipe that off with shop towel or something. Because, yeah, that just goes on like that. Shoot! Luckily, I've got one Taco Bell napkin left from lunch earlier in the week. So we'll just get that wiped off right there. So this is why we do the Gorilla Glue first and not the super noxious super glue. And holy cow, a truck horn. Thank you for that support on Ko-Fi right there. I'll have to check that out in just a second. But uh, yeah, right now we gotta get this to set. Excellent. Let me hold this as it sets, put some pressure on it. Nice. Yeah, Truckhorn, thank you so much. Holy cow. I really appreciate that. I really do. Okay, let's... Let's one hand to do this, and let's... Check out Ko-Fi there. Um... Holy cow, Truckhorn! Truckhorn! $50. Holy moly. I really, really appreciate that. That is incredible, Truckhorn. Holy cow. Thank you kindly. That's, uh... That's really lovely. Thank you very much, Truckhorn, for that support. I, uh, I appreciate that more than you know. You're helping put food on my table. You're keeping this young scientist off the streets. Thank you, Chuck. Appreciate you too so much. Thank you. Holy cow. Um, that's a hundred. It totally is, Gojira. Uh, although now I think they're like sixty cents each. Hopefully they come down in price again soon. But yeah. Anyway, that's a lot of ramen. It definitely buys a lot of ramen. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you very much. Holy cow. Um, really, spared no expense. And thank you, Tommy Plotticus, there. Good stuff. Holy cow. Yeah. Rum inflation, yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. Um, good stuff. And how do you too, Wonder Goon? How you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Cheap ramen is three for a dollar. They're like 60 cents each where I live, Kinamara. Yeah. But I can't complain. I'm, I'm really lucky to live where I do. I may also be moving soon to another, another part of the Bay Area. And I'll keep you appraised of that, everybody. If it happens, I'll be very excited about that. But uh, what I'm really excited about right now is these post-orbital bones are on there. We've got the back margin of our orbit, our eye socket right there, hence post-orbital bone. Yeah. And, uh... I'm almost ready to stick this onto the rest of the skull. 
but let's see where do these go? Are these are jugles. No. Um. Yeah, it's the difference between the Upper Midwest and California. There you go, Kinamara. Yeah, yeah. It is definitely more expensive around here. Most things are, at least. That should be... Let's look at our instructions and figure out where these go. Because it doesn't 100% look like... the actual bone would look as I expect it. Give me a second here. There we go. Yeah... There we go. Okay, they're down in the interior. That makes sense. So they butt up against that thing there. I'm not actually sure what these are called. I don't know if these are the vomers or ectopterygoids or what. But we're going to assemble these and then those fit onto there. Okay, that makes sense. Excellent. Let's put these long boys onto the rest of our brain case here. So I think they go on like this. Yeah. Excellent. Just like that. So this one seems pretty secure. We're gonna do this one first. It's gonna be the less fussy one. I'm just gonna put some Gorilla Glue onto here. And then we'll put some Cyanoacrylate in the recess in there. And let's see, that's like that, right? Yes. You go with bone thingies, Tila Aurora? I mean, we'll call them bone thingies for now. All right, bone thingy one. On the port side of the animal. Starbird side will be next. We don't actually use nautical terminology on Theropod dinosaurs, but sometimes it's fun to be goofy like that. Parts is parts, says Claire Perrin. I mean, to a certain extent. <laughs> yeah. All right, that just wants to say. That's beautiful. I mean, I'm actually tempted to put a little bit more glue right along there, just because why not? It's, it's sitting there. All right, next up over here. Gorilla glue on this connector. There we go. And cyanoacrylate in the recess there. There we go. Lovely. This one is less sure of itself, so I'm going to hold it there and let it cure for a minute. Yeah. Anyway, good stuff. Uh, sternum bone. It's, it's not the sternum, Tom Platicus, but I know you know that. These might be the pterygoids or something. I don't think they're the vomer. I think we already did the vomers. Let's take a look at our Allosaurus skull diagram again. Yeah. 
so it'll be... Oh, it is the pterygoids. Okay, nice. Yeah, PT, the pterygoids. So where are these in a human skull? Let's look at that. Skull pterygoid. Lateral pterygoid. Those are the muscles. No, we want the bone, not the muscles. only talking about the muscles. I guess the bones are, are just so tiny and wimpy in a human skull that they don't often get mentioned. There we go. Uh, pterygoid fossa of sphenoid. That might be it right there, actually. Or wait, no, hang on. That's not right. Sphenoid fossa, vertebra fossa. Hmm. Yeah, bizarre. It's somewhere up in the roof of the mouth on a human skull, or just behind it. But it must be so small and seemingly unimportant that, like, it doesn't even really get mentioned. HD and HB says they're making some of those names up. All of them are all all words are made up. HD and HB. But that's the thing is that this is a point that I want to help get across. Is that there is all kinds of wonderful anatomy that you may not be aware of, but it's part of your everyday life because it's part of your body, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot going on in a skull, even a human skull, you know, might not be as interesting as an Allosaurus skull, but there's still a lot of bones in there, and, I mean, shoot, they don't even really bother to, like, separate them. They would be... That's the Vomer, I think. Would it be these? It could be. I don't know. We've got such weird skulls. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Jimmy won't stop. How are you doing? Welcome back. It's good to see you. Yeah. Retro Rocho says you don't even want to know what's going on in my skull. Alright, shoot. I won't ask. You brought it up. <laughs> All right. Next up, our... Whatever these things are. Let's figure out what these bones are on our Allosaurus. Um, here we go. So these are going to go in here. They articulate with the... Um... Well, I don't know. What is that bone down there? Um. Oh, they, that's why I couldn't find an attachment on the brain case. It doesn't attach to the brain case. It attaches down here to the skull. So they're right there next to the jugals, it looks like. So... There we go. Um, I 
Ectoterigoids, I think, is what these are. The ectoterigoids are going to attach to the pterigoid bones. That makes sense. Um, given that I couldn't find the pterigoid bones in a human skull, good luck finding the ectoterigoids. But let's get those attached. Yeah. Uh, this music got a license to frill. There you go, Steely Dan. <laughs> So, again, this is so big, it's, like, tricky to fit it on the desk properly and have it be visible. And here we go. That's a nice fit, just like that. Good stuff. So, we've got one right there, and then the other side. Let's test fit the other side before I glue anything. It's a good thing I did. We've got some crud to get rid of there. Let me get my tools. get that one on there first. Well, actually, the other one felt more snug. Let's do that one first, because that one won't take as long to cure. That's good. It means I didn't use too little glue, at least. If you use slightly too much, then not enough. Wipe that away right here. solid. That'll stay there. Very good. Next up. I've got more cameras than that, Wonder Goon. Holy cow. One, two, three, four, currently. And I think I'll be adding even more soon once I figure some stuff out with OBS. It doesn't like some of my other cameras that I tried to set up, including the, the better camera that I have for the 3D printer. 
Mother just did not accept that one. So, yeah, but this is, this is good. I'll just let that sit like that. And I think the blue is doing its job. Very nice. There's the underside of our Allosaurus skull with our uh, ectopterygoids. Very nice. Very nice indeed. Yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> it's coming together. Yeah. Which I think... I think I might be able to put on the, uh, the brain case. Like, almost right now. Let me uh, look at the instructions. Make sure I'm not jumping the gun here. Uh... Oh, but first I can put on the articulars, I guess. Right? Does it skip that step? No, it wouldn't. Okay. Nice. So, with our brain case here, we can go ahead and put on our articular bones. Should count on like this. Inside like that. That's the wrong side. Like that. There we go. There's one right there. But I don't know exactly what angle to do that at. This is um this is tricky. This might be something that we have to do, like, a final, final step. Oh, no, it mounts in like that? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Here, let me try something here real quick. Just to make sure we're doing this right. and uh, get these glued on right now. Yeah, shoot. We're able to do more of this than I thought we'd be able to. This is excellent.
this side first. sitting like that. I'm going to put some more glue in this contact here. Let that just kind of naturally drip down into that recess. It's almost like icing a cake or something like that. It's a very, very viscous substance. Trying to do it artfully, but trying to do it in a way that works. Now for the other side, which is this is on camera. Good. Let's get some super glue in there. It's going to be nice and secure, I think. Yeah. Very excited about this. That's not coming apart. I mean, it would take a lot. Maybe like a real live Allosaurus. Right through, fight through it to get that to come apart. Excellent. This is really good stuff. And just for good measure, I'm going to put some more super glue in this juncture here. Get that nice and baked in. I can almost feel the heat that's coming off of it right now as this stuff cures. It's really nice. Thank you again for everyone who sent me months ago when I had that on the wish list. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, oh, oh. oh boy. We've just got two bones left now. Those are the bones that are currently printing. And uh, how much time is left on the on the timer? Let's see. One hour and one minute left on those ones. Excellent. Um, I won't be doing the final, final, final assembly today because I want to put the teeth in the upper jaw before we get the the lower jaw uh, articulated. So we'll probably do that tomorrow. Or will I put it when it's done, Tila Aurora? Uh, that's a good question. I might put it where the baby Triceratops is right now. 
Or I might put it where the Camarasaurus... I'll probably put it where the Camarasaurus... Camarasaurus skull. Um... Because you can still kind of see the Camarasaurus skull, yeah. In the background of my... My normal shot here. And, uh, I think that'd be really cool for that to be, like, obvious in the background. As soon as people tune in, this is usually the view that they see first. Really cool to have that right there. Yeah. And Tila says, I see why you want to move. More space. That and my landlord might be moving into my place, so... Yeah. I, uh, I might actually be moving out before she decides she wants to do that, though. We'll see. Very exciting. I'm going to go ahead and set this down on the floor. And just let it continue to set there. Yeah. Good stuff. Holy cow. Very exciting. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Um, yeah, and let's get rid of some of these tabs. There we go. And I believe we have a dinosaur deep dive to do, don't we? Let's do that while we wait for this thing to finish printing. Again, we won't be assembling the rest of it today, but we might. I think we'll attach the brain case to the rest of the skull after that's had time to set properly. So we'll let it do that for a while, and we will return to this. In a bit. But what was our dinosaur deep dive? Dynamo Terror, I believe, was redeemed by Matt M33 earlier. Matt M33, are you here right now? Let me know if you are, and if you are, we'll do your dinosaur deep dive pronto. Uh, you are excellent, Matt M33. Well, let's uh, let's get into that. Dynamo Terror is not a dinosaur I know a great deal about. I want to say it's from New Mexico and it's a Tyrannosauroid from like the early part of the late Cretaceous, perhaps. Let's take a look. Yeah, Dynamo Terror. There we go. The name means. Powerful terror. It's one of those um, slightly goofy names, and it's from Colorado, from the Menifee Formation. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I don't know if we have a great deal of material from this animal. But yeah. You love the dinosaur deep dives? Well, good, Wonder Goon, because we are going to be revamping the Dinosaur Deep Dive soon. I'm working on some uh, some graphic stuff for that. Yeah. But anyway. Dynamo Terror. It's got one of those names that's inspired a lot of different paleo artists to reconstruct it. It's, it's a dramatic name. Dynamo Terror. <laughs> Um, like I said, slightly goofy. But, uh, it's, you know, largely what you would expect from a Tyrannosaur. I think that's generally the idea with Dynamo Terror. Thank you for gifting a, a sub to the dinosaur, deep dive dinosaur, Victarious. I appreciate that. <laughs> We're now at 30 out of 60. We're now... Half of the way to our sub goal for the day. Thank you for that, Victarious. Very thoughtful. I appreciate that. Yeah. So, Dynamo Terra. I don't think we have very much of this animal, but let's... Let's take a look. In fact, let's look at a skeletal. Um, okay, yeah, so not a lot. Not a lot from this animal. There is a decent part of a skull, though, which is important when we're talking about Tyrannosaurus or any dinosaur, honestly. Looks like we've got a coracoid, a scapula, 
a fragmentary pubis and a, a, a proximal caudal vertebra and then a good part of a skull. I seem to recall that this dinosaur was described back when I lived in Montana. I think we talked about it at a Dead Lizard Society meeting. And back then it was only known from a few different bones and since then they found a little bit more of it, I, I want to say. But, uh... Let's see. Yeah. Subadult or adult ad individual about 9 meters or 30 feet long with an incomplete associated skeleton. Uh, it was named in 2018. That's later than I would have thought. That was my last year in Montana. By Andrew McDonald, Doug Wolf, Alton Dooley. Not familiar with that name. It was closely related to Teratophonius and Lythronax, which makes a lot of sense. Those are two different Tyrannosaurus from Utah. Uh, this dinosaur is from Colorado. Or... No, it's not. It's from northwestern New Mexico, like I said originally. I thought I remembered that correctly. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um... A more complete specimen of Dynamo Terror was identified in 2021 but has not yet been described in detail. It is known as specimen WSC-1027 and is also known from the Menifee Formation. Um, very nice. Okay. So we've got more material from this animal. I know that one looked really scanty right there. Looks like, how can, the, how can you possibly tell what this animal looked like based on those scraps? That's the thing, is that paleontology is a science, and science is about testing ideas. One of the ways that we test ideas is to make hypotheses about what an animal looked like, and then test those hypotheses by going out and trying to find more of it. So, this is what we call a skeletal diagram. There's the bones representing what we know of this animal that's been described thus far. But given that it's clearly a Tyrannosauroid, a relative of T-Rex, Tyrannosaurus, Rex. We can get a general idea of what its body outline would be like. With a dinosaur like this, Tyrannosaurs tend to be fairly conservative anatomically. It's not like we have one member of the family that has crazy stegosaur-style plates on its back, or, you know, a super long neck like a sauropod or anything. Tyrannosaurs look like Tyrannosaurs. They've hit upon a pretty efficient way of being a big land-living meat-eater, and they pretty much stick to that. The differences between them are going to be more subtle, and so we can be generally sure of what the outline of the animal is going to be like. Sometimes there are a few little surprises, but, you know, most of the differences between it, this and its relatives are they're going to be, to untrained eyes, fairly fairly subtle uh, aspects of its, its osteology, its bone anatomy. Yeah... A wonder goon, this dinosaur is from long before T-Rex, from millions of years before. The Menifee Formation, I believe, is Campanian. So let me show you. This is the International Chrono Stratigraphic Chart. And so here's the age of dinosaurs, the Mesozoic right here. Dinosaurs first evolved right about here. About 240 million years ago, probably. The earliest dinosaurs we have are like 235. And then dinosaurs have their heyday in the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. T. rex lived up here in the Maastrichtian, at the end of the Maastrichtian epoch, the Maastrichtian stage. Uh, this dinosaur, Dynamo Terror, is from the Campanian. So from one stage before, but you see, the Campanian is actually pretty long. Um,. And it's from, I think, earlier Campanian. But let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, lower Campanian, Allison member of the Menifee Formation. So yeah, lower Campanian down here. So probably closer to about 80 million years old. T-Rex is closer to about 60... From 66 million years ago at the most recent, down to about 68. Dynamo Terror is closer to 80 million years ago. So like 12 million years older than T-Rex. Something like that. That makes sense? Yeah. 
Uh, but in the grand scheme of things, pretty near to the end of the Cretaceous period, and thus the end of the Age of Dinosaurs. Uh, uh, let's see. The binomial name Dynamo Terror honors Dynamosaurus Imperiosus, a junior synonym. We talked about junior synonyms yesterday. It's like uh, when uh, the same critter's accidentally given two names. The one that was before is called the Junior Synonym. Um, yeah. Uh, so Dynamosaurus, that's such a cool name that I guess the authors wanted to kind of sort of bring back part of it, so they named it Dynamo Terror. Yeah. So that name would have been a childhood favorite, one of the authors. Um... Yeah, but in 2020, uh, Chen Gyu Yun considered Dynamo Terror a nomen dubium. A nomen dubium is basically like, you know, like, oh, you got a little carried away in describing this thing. It's not really different enough to give it a name. That's a nomen dubium. Dubious name. Because of the highly fragmentary nature of the holotype, the original specimen, and lack of etapomorphies, unique characteristics. As two of the original etapomorphies are present in other Tyrannosaurids. Additionally, the fragmentary nature of a frontal makes it uncertain whether the etapomorphies are even comparable to other Tyrannosaurids. Um, but now we've got, apparently, a more complete specimen. So we should be able to hopefully see, is this actually a legit animal or is it not? Because I guess it was fairly fragmentary at the beginning, like we saw in that skeletal there. Um... Here is that paper. It is open access. There is a link right there if you'd like to see the original descriptive paper for this critter. And there it is. Yeah. Um, where's the PDF? Download. There we go. Give me a second. Let me open this in the browser so you can see it. There we go. Beautiful. Yeah. So this is the original descriptive paper. I think it's really, really important on this channel, not just in dinosaur deep dives, but in general. If we're talking at a, about a, a specific dinosaur or a specific concept, if there's a paper that's been published on it, let's look at the paper. I think most people who go about their daily lives never really have an opportunity to see scientific literature. For most people, their interaction with scientific literature is like, uh, you know, maybe you're driving home from work. I've used this example many times. And you hear the radio hosts all chirpy and upbeat going, Oh, well, did you know a, a scientist today reporting on a... They've got a new study that shows that, uh, you know, chocolate actually uh, is good for your health. Something like that. Like, most people in the general public, that's like their only interaction with scientific studies is hearing about some study on the news, which may not even be legit in the first place. Scientific studies might seem like this kind of far-off, esoteric, you know, nebulous thing. So I think it's really important to actually show the scientific literature. This is from the journal Pierre J. This is the original descriptive paper for Dynamo Terror. Uh, and an abstract, if... You're probably not going to read the whole paper. Most scientists don't read the whole paper unless it's, like, your field that you're working in. Then maybe you'll read the whole paper. Uh, unless it's, like, directly related to your own research. Or if it's just super, super interesting, then you read the whole paper. Normally, we just kind of read the abstract or skim it. The abstract is... Think of, it, think of it like a movie trailer that also spoils the ending of a movie. It's a quick summary of the paper. Uh, let's see... We report a new Tyrannosaurid represented by an associated skeleton from the lower Campanian Allison member of the Menifee Formation of New Mexico. Despite fragmentation of much of the axial and appendicular skeleton prior to discovery, ooh boy, this thing got 
eroded to heck, it sounds like, before they actually got to it, which is unfortunate. The frontals, which are the bones, basically the forehead bones. A metacarpal, which is, uh, uh, you know, one of the upper hand bones. And two pedal phalanges, that's two toe bones, are well preserved. The frontals exhibit an unambiguous atapomorphy and a second potential atapomorphy that distinguish this specimen from all other Tyrannosaurids. That's why they felt justified in giving it a new name, is because they said they found a unique feature on it. However, as we just heard, some other scientists looking at this said, that's not that unique, what? And they're claiming that Dynamoterra should be considered dubious, a nomen dubium. Anyway. Um, yeah, it seems to come out really close to T-Rex on the family tree. Laser scanning of the frontals and creation of a composite 3D model allows the frontal region of the skull roof of Dynamo Terror to be reconstructed. Very nice. So the frontal region of the skull, I can show you on the Allosaurus skull now what this is. Yeah, this is already a nice teaching tool. So, uh, the frontals are these bones right here. Or no, hang on. Are they here? They're here. Blah. Um, because these are the nasals, right? Frontals right here on the forehead. That's these bones. They're kind of flat, sometimes even kind of bowl-shaped like that. Those are the frontals. Yeah. Um... Yeah, and HD and HB says you read the abstract to find out if you want to read the rest or just look at the pictures. That's that's how that goes at HD. Yes, it's yes, a indeed. Paleontologist version of heaven. Uh, Blackbird nine two. Thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. Yeah. So let's go through the rest of the paper real quick. We'll just look at the pretty pictures. Uh, there's those three D scanned bones there. Very nice. So those are the frontals. They're kind of chunked up. Oh, boy. Yeah, naming a dinosaur on such fragmentary material is not always a good idea. But they went ahead and did it here. I wonder if... If we can find these files on Morphosource. Morphosource is a wonderful resource. Um... If you're looking for 3D data on biological or paleontological specimens. And there we go. It's right there. Nice. This might take a minute to load. Well, hello, hello, DJ K-pop girl. Welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? How is your stream? Hello, Raiders. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. DJ Raid, indeed. I hope you had a wonderful stream. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. We're talking about this dinosaur Dynamo Terror right here. Uh, Dynamo Terror. Um... Slightly goofy there. That's... There we go. Dynamo Terror. It's a tyrannosaur from uh, the late Cretaceous of New Mexico. And we were looking at the original scientific publication. There is one of the toe bones right there. Um, and I guess you can actually download this. If I wanted to, I could download this and 3D print this, uh, this toe bone, this pedal phalanx right here. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, though, so I won't. And we're really trying to finish our Allosaurus skull at this point. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Pretty neat. I wonder what other files they have here on Morphosource. I'm careful to call it Morphosource and not Morphosaurus, because that's just the way that my brain wants to work. I was trying to type it out earlier, too, and... I accidentally typed in Morphosaurus. <laughs> but yeah. Hmm. 
Yeah, and there's a caudal centrum, so this is one of the tailbones right there. Yeah. Good stuff. But you can see how fragmentary it is. They really named this, like, based on almost nothing. Like, not a lot of material. Um, but... Maybe that's okay, because I think they realized they had more of this animal that they were going to find or did find before they published this. This is the thing, it's always kind of a delicate balance when you're trying to describe a new dinosaur and get it published. Do you, uh... Do you wait decades after you first find the thing and make sure you get all your ducks in a row and only publish it then? Or do you just kind of do a quick and dirty publication soon after you first find it and then later follow up with something that's more detailed? Really, I think sometimes that's the better option. And hopefully that's the path that they're taking here. Um, hopefully they've got much better material of this animal that they'll be publishing on before too long. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, Dynamo Terror. Not a whole lot else to say about it. Except, I guess let's look at some depictions. Some different art that people have done of this dinosaur. Because it is a Tyrannosaur, there will be a lot of different drawings and sculpts and all kinds of stuff that have been done for this animal. Yeah, that's actually some really neat art. This Tyrannosaur going after an Ankylosaur there. An unsuspecting Notosaur. All these turtles falling off its back. I like that a lot. That's that's some cool art. That's really neat. Uh, and uh, let's find one of the original press releases. Um, Deadly dinosaur species related to T. rex discovered by Hemet paleontologist. That must be Hemet, California, right? Yeah, Andrew McDonald. Um, good stuff. This is it. That's that's it right there. Not a whole lot from this animal. Um, yeah. But you know, they're finding more, which is good. Yeah! A handful of dinosaur. Yes, there you go, Tila. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. So yeah, Dynamo Terror. It's got a very charismatic name. It doesn't necessarily have the most material associated with it, but you know. Sometimes that's how it goes. Uh, and Bruce Lee says, Why is Tyrannosaurus the most popular or well-known dinosaur? Uh, there is a whole video, a YouTube video, that I was working on ages ago, before I ever started here on Twitch. Like 2018, I was working on this big video. 2017, really, on Tyrannosaurus. The idea is, is T-Rex overrated and the conclusion I came to at the end was like kind of spoil it for you no T-Rex is still underrated but there are other dinosaurs that are massively more underrated Tyrannosaurus gets maybe a disproportionate amount of attention But it is a remarkable dinosaur. It's the largest of the Tyrannosaurs, one of the biggest meat-eating animals to ever walk the Earth. And because it is at the very end of its lineage, right before the extinction event that wipes out the non-bird dinosaurs, it is kind of the end of the line, the, the ultimate theropod dinosaur outside of birds, obviously. So yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, but there are other dinosaurs that don't get nearly as much attention, which are also really, really cool. Like Yangshuanosaurus doesn't get nearly enough attention. 
and we don't even have like a really cool illustration of it. We should. That's a pretty neat one, actually. That's really neat. Yeah. This is basically like uh, it's a lot like Allosaurus, but it lived in China. It's also an Allosaur, I believe. Um, and they got truly huge, like up to T-Rex sized, pretty much. Enormous animal, Yangshuanosaurus. There's of course Acrocanthosaurus. Which is a spectacular animal. Really, really cool. I think its skeleton is even cooler looking than that of T-Rex. And it got almost as big as T-Rex also. Lived much earlier in the Cretaceous. But it's, uh, I don't know, it's a very cool dinosaur. Acrocanthosaurus. Lenina here in chat has, uh, an Acrocanthosaurus tattoo. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'm talking about, uh, like, big, big theropod dinosaurs here that are honestly just as cool as T-Rex, but they don't get nearly as much attention in pop culture. Dilophosaurus, also very cool and very misrepresented in popular culture because of Jurassic Park, Lenina, and Shunosaurus, yeah, another very cool underrepresented dinosaur. I agree. Shunosaurus is, uh, is it still considered a Shunosaurid, member of its own family. But yeah, very cool, kind of semi-armored sauropod dinosaur from the early Jurassic of China. Although it might be closer to middle or even late Jurassic now, I think a lot of this stuff has been redated recently. Um. Yeah, Shunosaurus. A cool animal. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, it's even got a bit of a tail club there. Um, which you can kind of see in this illustration. Or this one here. Yeah. That's such a cool... That's such a cool picture. Todd Marshall does such cool work. Let's see if we can find that larger. big as we're gonna get but yeah really really cool artwork I've admired Todd Marshall's stuff for a long time so yeah yeah but it has a bendy tail I mean most sauropod dinosaurs did have bendy tails HD yeah yeah it's funny by contrast he would have a stiffer tail probably this uh Sichuanosaurus who is this that lives next to Shunosaurus Shunosaurus is from which Formation. The Sichuan province. Um, from which formation, though? Yeah, the Shiashaxi Mao formation. So would have lived alongside who? Metosaurus, Wyangosaurus, Gassosaurus. Okay. By the luck of the draw, dinosaurs who had been dominant over mammals in ordinary times got felled in a mass extinction. It's true. Paper cuts. Thank you for the 11 months of support, by the way. Really appreciate that. Thank you earnestly, kindly, really appreciate it. Uh, um, so yeah, and there's the tail club of uh, Shunosaurus. Not, you know, it's not super high caliber or anything, but do some damage at the end of a tail like that, you know? Just a little bit of extra weight at the end of that tail. Bow. Yeah. So, yeah. And, yeah, terror birds are super, super cool. Um, we might even do some special streams about terror birds for Halloween this year. We'll see. Terror birds, Halloween, you know? Seems appropriate. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you say we attach the brain case of our Allosaurus to our Allosaurus skull? I say let's go for it. Yeah. Here is our skull. 
skull here. Sitting there for now in the chair. And there is our brain case. So, let's see how this is going to work. Hold this here between my knees. It's honestly too big to fit on there. Well, you can kind of see it. Not really. There we go. Begin docking procedure. like a two-person job. Alright, it looks like my pterygoids might be a little bit crooked. Are they going off to one side? They kind of are. So close. Hmm. Hang on, I realize this is not terribly interesting to watch at the moment, but it should kind of snap into place and then we'll be able to show you. It's just, this is a critical moment. I've got to make sure this happens correctly. There we go. That's working like it's supposed to. just have a two more bones that are still printing and then this thing is done um fantastic well and it's nice how that just snaps into place i don't even really have to glue it to hold it there i will glue it after today's stream um just to make sure that it holds together but holy cow and uh the extra bone that we're printing which is Right here. Um, that will just about do it. Then we'll print the teeth tomorrow. We'll have ourselves a full Allosaurus skull. Holy cow. Very exciting. Yes, indeed. Holy moly. Um, that makes me really, really happy. I'm gonna set this over here. Man, is that big and cool. <laughs> yeah! And how much is it weighted compared to the actual skull? This would be about the same weight or a little bit lighter than... Or maybe a little bit heavier, excuse me, than... The skull, if the bone were fresh, but fossil bone is going to be about 10 times heavier than this, if not more. Fossil bone is really heavy. Yeah. Um, then print the neck vertebrae so you can wall mount it, says Musaica. I don't have the neck vertebrae, unfortunately. I don't have files for that. But, um, you know what? Who knows what the future holds? That could be pretty cool. Yeah. HD says you're going to need a bigger shelf. Let's going to go where the, uh, Camarasaurus is right now, at least 
shoot if it'll, if it'll fit. We'll have to see. Um, yeah, we'll figure something out. Man, am I excited. Oh boy. Allosaurus. Holy cow. Um, pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Might be too big, actually, says Claire. I mean, it... You want to test it real quick? Let's, let's see. clip ever. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why I use replicas and not actual mounted dinosaur fossil skeletons live on stream. Got it? Oh boy. Um. Yeah. Uh. Well, well, well. I'm going to have some reassembling to do before tomorrow's stream. In fact, I might even wrap this up right now, actually. Uh... Yeah. Let's go ahead and do that. been so careful not to mess with that at all. I didn't realize how unstable it was because I've never knocked it before. So anyway. Let's find somebody to raid out to here. And it's okay. It's not your fault, Claire. Please. Uh, let's go raid into Psy Ant's streams. There we go. And commence our wrap-up procedure here. Yeah. Uh. Thank you, everybody, for a wonderful stream. Sorry to wrap up early, but I gotta make sure that I can have all of this up and running again, because I'm also... I'm gonna have a really busy day tomorrow already. Um. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you, everybody whose names are showing up here in the credits. Thank you to followers, subscribers, resubscribers, gifters, cheerers, moderators, lurkers, and everybody else. Uh, and without further ado, we're going to go right into science streams, see what he's up to, and uh, show some science love to his part of the science community. All right. 